Spaghetti westerns are a subgenre of western films that emerged in the mid 1960s, primarily produced and directed by Italian creators. The term spaghetti western was coined by foreign critics because most of these westerns were produced and directed by Italians. So, just a smidge problematic connecting these films to pasta. I would have got the spaghetti with the Caesar. But not as complicated as some might make you think. Back in the 1960s, Italian directors weren't exactly working with Hollywood budgets. They needed a cheaper stand-in for the Wild West and found it in, you guessed it, Espana or Spain. Specifically, the dry, sun-baked regions of Almeria, Spain, which looked convincingly wild but came without a Wild West price tag. It was the budget-friendly West. All the tumbleweeds, none of the expenses. Unlike their American counterparts, Spaghetti Westerns were known for their stylized violence, gritty realism, and morally ambiguous characters in addition to the low budgets. Their distinctive cinematography often featured extreme close-ups, dramatic music scores, and a focus on the harshness of frontier life. Imagine this. A bunch of Italian directors with a passion for John Ford's classic American westerns, but maybe, just maybe, too fond of adding a twist. Grittier stories, less morality, and a hefty sprinkle of <laughs> good luck guessing who's the hero here. Spaghetti Westerns took what American Westerns had, added a good helping of cynical, tough-as-nails anti-heroes, and... Voila, a genre as iconic as the pasta was named after. Now this ain't no Marion Morrison, John Way. Musical Western, you won't find speeches about justice or freedom. It's more like, I want gold and I want it now. And let's not forget those extreme close-ups like, we're talking really close, where you can practically count every bead of sweat and speculate on how much they spent on teeth whitening. So, in summary, spaghetti westerns were westerns, just uh, not American. Instead of high noon duels with clean-shaven heroes, you get dusty, scruffy men with five o'clock shadows who look like they haven't slept, or showered, in weeks. You might say they're the bad boys of the western genre, and uh, isn't that what makes them so irresistible? It's giving, I can fix him. But girl, let's be real, you can't fix him. But you can fix those dusty buttons below and be a real caballero. And pressing the like button. And if you're as hungry for more as a gunslinger after a dusty trail, hit that subscribe button faster than Clint Eastwood's trigger finger. Settle up in the comments too. Let me know your favorite spaghetti western or what you'd go by in the wild west. Like what would be your man with no name? Name. Now giddy up y'all, let's keep this western ride rolling. Now that we've officially begun our quest for the gold nugget of knowledge rush, let's talk about the uniqueness of spaghetti westerns apart from their charisma, nerve, and talent. Now let's expand on specific stylistic and thematic aspects that separated these Italian-made classics from their American counterparts. These films are notable for their use of extreme close-ups, slow zooms, and long. Silences. Creating a tense atmosphere, letting the tension build until you're practically begging for someone to draw. The intense music, often composed by Ennio Morricone, an absolutely legendary composer, adds to the dramatic effect. One of my favorite films in particular, Once Upon a Time in the West from 1968, expands on these themes. Director Sergio Leone, a legend in the genre, took his spaghetti western style to new heights in this film, known for its slow, contemplative pacing and meticulous attention to detail. Unlike his earlier works, including the infamous A Fistful of Dollars in 1964, yes, I know it's a ripoff of Yojimbo, but we're getting to that. We're going to get to it. Don't worry. Hold your horses. And that works extremely well for this video. And The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly in 1966, both fantastic films, 
Once upon a time in the West used silence and stillness to build atmosphere with long stretches where little to no dialogue occurs. The opening scene is nearly 10 minutes of ambient noise and silence and shows three gunmen waiting for a train. It is a master class in building tension through pure atmosphere. This use of silence, wide shots, and deliberate pacing became a signature spaghetti western style that contrasts with fast-paced Hollywood westerns, proving that silence and stillness can be as thrilling as a shootout. In American westerns, you had good guys and bad guys. Clear as day. But in spaghetti westerns, you get characters like Django from Django in 1966, who drags a coffin through town and doesn't exactly fit the white knight archetype. Or The Great Silence in 1968, where the anti-hero silence doesn't speak a word. Well, who would have thought? Really lives up to his name, and shoots his way through snow-covered landscapes, showing us that in the West, things aren't exactly coming up roses. It's more like pushing daisies. American Westerns usually had squeaky clean heroes in white hats fighting for justice, but in spaghetti Westerns? Forget the white hats, these guys barely had clean laundry. The protagonists were complex, morally gray anti-heroes who'd likely rob you and then lend your bus fare to get home. These films had a darker tone, showing that in the Wild West, survival meant being a little bit of a good guy, a little bit of a bad guy, and a lot of, um, whatever got the job done. Basically, there was a lot more cynicism and nuance, much more art imitating life than compared to the Americans. Then there's The Big Gun Down in 1966, where Morricone's haunting score and slow, deliberate zooms make every scene feel like an epic, even if it's just two guys staring each other down. Sergio Solima's film takes the unique stylistic elements of spaghetti westerns, close-ups, tension-building zooms, and Morricone's haunting score, and applies them to a story that also challenges the traditional western tropes. The film follows a bounty hunter who gradually becomes sympathetic toward his targets. Would that be considered reverse Stockholm Syndrome? Subverting the clear-cut roles of hero and villain. It's a prime example of Spaghetti Western's dark tone and willingness to experiment with complex protagonists who evolve in morally ambiguous settings. Let's start with the godfather of this genre, Sergio Leone. A director extraordinaire, his films played a significant role in defining the genre. His distinctive style, characterized by operatic storytelling and stylized violence, became synonymous with spaghetti westerns. The Dollars Trilogy, or the Man With No Name Trilogy, includes some of the genre's defining works. Leone's operatic style became so iconic that today, even directors like Quentin Tarantino pay tribute with their own drawn-out, are-they-going-to-shoot, or cut, or just stare at each other to death scenes. Sergio Leone made Spaghetti Westerns famous with his Dollars trilogy, but Sergio Corbucci gave us darker twists as in Django and The Great Silence, with the former directly influencing Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained in 2012. The D is silent. I know. Corbucci's films are distinguished by their gritty realism, graphic violence, and morally complex characters. Then there's Enzo G. Castellari. If Leone had the long hold shots, Castellari brought the slow motion and dynamic action sequences to his cinematography, especially with one of his infamous films, Kioma in 1976, which blends mysticism and epic storytelling with a gritty western. Of course, there are many other notable genre-defining directors I could mention, but I don't want this film to be that. True to the spaghetti western genre. Now that you're fully intrigued and ready for a thrill and a drawn-out sundown showdown, let me give you a quick Spaghetti Western guide on where to start when you're first exploring this wild west of a genre. 
So you obviously have to start with the Dollars Trilogy by Sergio Leone. This trilogy is iconic, some of you might say cliché, for a reason. Particularly those in my generation may find these films a little jaunting with our Gen Z attention spans. Because with all the slow burn paces and drawn out stare downs, it's a little challenging. And don't worry, I've had many nights where I've tried to convince friends to sit down and watch some classics with me and to their dismay they end up being over three hours long. So yeah, it's worth it though, I think. A Fistful of Dollars or Baron Pognon di Dollari, directed by Sergio Leone, A Fistful of Dollars was produced on a modest budget of approximately $200,000. Tell that! To her Harvey. And if you've been on this channel long enough, you get that joke. This film is an unofficial adaptation of Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo in 1961, which led to legal disputes over rights and credits. You could say they had a showdown for rights and credits. Very in theme with the spaghetti western style. Clint Eastwood, then known for his role in the TV series Rawhide, was cast as the enigmatic man with no name, marking his first leading role in cinema. Filming took place in Spain's Almeria region, chosen for its resemblance to the American Southwest. Upon its release in Italy in 1964, the film achieved significant commercial success, grossing over $4 million. However, its U.S. release in 1967 received mixed reviews. Some critics dismissed it as a low-budget imitation of American Westerns. In my opinion, they were just jealous that they did a Western better and cheaper. Despite this, audiences appreciated its fresh take on the genre, leading to a box office gross of approximately $14.5 million in the U.S., a Fistful of Dollars is credited with revitalizing the Western genre and establishing the Spaghetti Western as a significant cinematic movement. And it also has credit in creating one of the best Star Trek TNG episodes called A Fistful of Datas, which is one of my all-time favorite episodes. I'd recommend checking that out. The film also launched Clint Eastwood's film career, transforming him into an international star. <laughs> Following the success of A Fistful of Dollars, Sergio Leone directed this sequel for a few dollars more, or Per Quatre Dollaro in Pia, with an increased budget of around $600,000. Lee Van Cleef was cast as Colonel Douglas Mortimer, a seasoned bounty hunter, adding depth to the narrative. Filming again took place in Spain, utilizing locations like, you guessed it, Almeria and Granada, to depict the rugged frontier. Released in Italy in 1965 and in the U.S. in 1967, the film outperformed its predecessor at the box office, grossing approximately $15 million in the U.S. Critics noted its improved production values and complex character dynamics, with some praising it as superior to the original. For a few dollars more, solidified the Spaghetti Western's place in cinema and further established Sergio Leone's reputation as a master director. The film's stylistic elements, such as its innovative use of music and editing, have been studied and emulated by filmmakers. Lee Van Cleef's performance revitalized his career and led to numerous roles within the genre. <laughs> Arguably the most infamous, the good, the bad, and the ugly, or il biono, il brutto, il cattivo. Literally, the good, the ugly, and the bad. In 1966, sounded better rearranged in English, I guess. The most famous of the trilogy, it's an epic tale that defines the genre with its sprawling narrative and iconic music. <laughs> With a budget of approximately 1.2 million, this film was the most ambitious of the trilogy. Sergio Leone expanded the narrative scope, incorporating the American Civil War as a backdrop. The film reunited Clint Eastwood and Lee Van Cleef and introduced Eli Wallach as Tuco the Ugly. I wonder 
if that's where they got the name Tuco from Breaking Bad. Filming locations included Spain's Tabernas Desert and the Bojas region, chosen for their expansive landscapes. Released in Italy in 1966 and in the U.S. in 1967, the film was a commercial success, grossing over $25 million worldwide. While initial critical reception was mixed, with some critics finding it excessively violent, it has since been reevaluated and is now considered a classic. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is often cited as one of the greatest westerns ever made. Its influence extends beyond the genre, impacting filmmakers across various styles. The film score by Ennio Morricone is iconic, with the main theme becoming synonymous with the Western genre. The climactic three-way duel has been parodied and referenced in numerous films and television shows. The Dollars Trilogy stands as a groundbreaking series that forever changed the Western genre with the films A Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Sergio Leone introduced audiences to a new kind of Western, a grittier, morally complex world where heroes were drifters with no names and villains were as human as they were ruthless. Through Leone's iconic close-ups, tension-building silences, and Ennio Morricone's unforgettable scores, the trilogy crafted a visual and auditory language that became the gold standard for spaghetti westerns. Today, the trilogy's legacy endures, having shaped not only westerns, but cinema as a whole, inspiring filmmakers across genres to explore the beauty and grit and the complexity within simplicity. If that makes sense. These films are more than just classics. They are cinematic legends etching the man with no name into the timeless canon of film history. Django, or Django. <laughs> Just a name. In 1966, known for its brutal tone and the iconic coffin dragging antihero, has become a cult classic. Directed by Sergio Corbucci, Django was produced on a modest budget, characteristic of many spaghetti westerns of the era. The film was shot primarily in Spain, again, utilizing the arid landscapes of the Almeria region to emulate the American Southwest. By the time we're through with this video, you're going to know exactly where Almeria is on a map, and you're going to be able to impress all your friends and family with this knowledge. Franco Nero, then a relatively unknown actor, was cast in the titular role, marking a significant breakthrough in his career. The film's production was notable for its gritty and violent aesthetic, pushing the boundaries of on-screen violence for its time. Upon its release in Italy in 1966, Django achieved substantial commercial success, grossing over 1 billion lira. However, its graphic violence led to controversy. The film was banned in several countries, including the United Kingdom, where it remained prohibited until 1993. What? Despite this, it garnered a cult following and was praised for its stylistic elements and Nero's performance. Django is considered a seminal work in the spaghetti western genre, influencing numerous films and filmmakers. Its titular character became iconic, inspiring over 30 unofficial sequels and adaptations. The film's themes and stylistic choices have been referenced in various media, most notably in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained in 2012, which pays homage to Corbucci's original. Franco Nero's portrayal of Django solidified his status as a leading actor in Italian cinema. Overall, Django's impact on the Western genre and its enduring popularity underscore its significance in film history. Once Upon a Time in the West, or Sierra Una Volta y West, in 1968, a beautifully shot, haunting Western with a stellar cast, it's a must-watch for deeper exploration of the genre. It's also one of my top spaghetti Westerns for you to watch, because I love this one. Directed by Sergio Leone, Once Upon a Time in the West was produced with a budget of of approximately five million, an unusually high budget for a spaghetti western, making it one of the most ambitious spaghetti westerns of its time. 
Why, do you ask, does this spaghetti western have such a large budget when part of the genre's defining aspects include a low budget? Well, I'm about to tell you. Leone's previous films, especially The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, were huge international hits, performing exceptionally well at the box office. This success demonstrated that spaghetti westerns could draw large audiences, especially when directed by Leone. Based on his track record, studios were more willing to invest in his ambitious vision, trusting his ability to generate substantial returns. One studio in particular gave Leone a lot of creative leverage. Unlike most spaghetti westerns, which relied on small European production companies, Once Upon a Time in the West had backing from a major Hollywood studio, Paramount Pictures. Paramount recognized the commercial potential of Leone's work in the U.S. and international markets, and they saw an opportunity to partner with him on a project that could appeal to both American and European audiences. You could say their collaboration was paramount to the Spaghetti Western legacy. With this Hollywood support, the film had access to larger financial resources than typical Italian productions. The screenplay was a collaborative effort between Leone, Sergio Donate, and story contributors Dario Argento and Bernardo Bertolucci. Oh my gosh, our favorite giallo director has Western connections. It just keeps getting better. He should do a Western giallo, honestly. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? By the way, if you know any Western giallos out there, let me know, because that would have been, that's that's a cool crossover I've never even heard of. The film featured an ensemble cast, including Henry Fonda, cast against type as the villain Frank, although I prefer him in the villainous roles, because I love the villain, if you can't tell. I'm a big fan of the villain roles. Charles Bronson as Harmonica, Claudia Cardinal as Jill McBain, and Jason Robards as Cheyenne. Filming locations included Spain's Tabanas Desert, Utah's Monument Valley, and Cenacitas Studios in Rome. Ennio Morricone composed the iconic score, completing it before filming even began, allowing Leone to play the music on set to inspire the actor's performances. Upon its release in Italy in December 1968, the film received mixed reviews but performed well at the box office. However, the initial U.S. release in 1969 was met with a lukewarm response, partly due to significant cuts that reduced its runtime from 165 minutes to 145 minutes. Critics were divided. Some praised its operatic style and depth, while others found it overly slow and stylized. Despite the mixed critical reception, the film has since been reevaluated and is now considered a classic of the genre. Thank the divine entities out there for reevaluation of this classic and not letting it become mere dust on the trail of the spaghetti western genre. Once Upon a Time in the West has left an indelible mark on cinema, influencing a lot of filmmakers and genres. Its operatic style, complex characters, and innovative use of music and cinematography have been widely studied and emulated. The film's score by Ennio Morricone is particularly celebrated, with its haunting melodies becoming synonymous with the Western genre. In 2009, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress, recognizing its cultural, historical, and aesthetic significance. A well-deserving film for preservation, in my opinion. Once Upon a Time in the West stands as a testament to Sergio Leone's vision and craftsmanship, continuing to captivate audiences and inspire filmmakers worldwide. The Great Silence or El Grande Silencio in 1968. A dark, snowbound western with a bleak ending, this film showcases the genre's range and depth. Directed by Sergio Corbucci, The Great Silence was produced as an Italian-French co-production with a budget of approximately 309 million lira. The film was shot primarily in the Italian Dolomites, 
utilizing these snow-covered landscapes to create a stark and unforgiving setting, a departure from the typical arid environments of spaghetti westerns. Jean-Louis Trigonat starred as the mute gunslinger Silence. The film's score was composed by Ennio Morricone, whose haunting melodies added depth to the bleak narrative. Upon its release in November 1968 in Italy, The Great Silence received a mediocre commercial reception grossing 309 million yira. It didn't even break even. It just got even. Which is also a theme in Spaghetti Westerns. Its bleak and dark tone, along with its unconventional ending, sparked controversy and led to its withholding from release in the United States until 2001. However, the film fared better in other countries and gradually gained a cult following. Over time, The Great Silence has been reevaluated and is now widely regarded as one of the greatest films of the spaghetti western genre, acknowledged as Corbucci's masterpiece. Its subversion of genre conventions, utilization of snowbound landscapes, and Morricone's score have been particularly praised. The film's reputation grew, leading to several theatrical re-releases, most notably in 2012 and 2017. Overall, The Great Silence stands as a testament to Corbucci's vision and craftsmanship, continuing to captivate audiences and inspire filmmakers worldwide. So, you want to know where to go after these films? I got your partner. A Bullet for the General in 1966. Known for his focus on political and social themes, Damiano Damiani. That is a cool-ass name. I have to say, that sounds badass. That sounds like an outlaw's name, if you ask me. Or spaghetti western anti-hero's name. Damiano Damiani. Damiano Damiani. Damiano Damiani. Okay, I just love saying it. Brings a sharp revolutionary edge to a bullet for the general. Forget your typical lone cowboy rides into town plot. This film is what happens when the Wild West collides with revolution. It isn't just some shoot 'em up either. It's a politically charged journey into the heart of the Mexican Revolution, following a bandit turned revolutionary who starts questioning who's really on his side. With El Choncho, played by Jean Maria Volante, you get a protagonist who's as unpredictable as he is morally gray, which, in spaghetti western tradition, is way more interesting than your classic hero. And with its take on power, loyalty, and betrayal, this film digs into the genre's potential for social commentary in a way most westerns don't even touch. If you're ready for a western that thinks while it shoots, well, this one's calling your name. And if you shoot, I think you always should think before that. So, yeah. Death Rides a Horse in 1967. If Revenge is a dish that has to be eaten cold. Death Rides a Horse is practically frozen. Giulio Petroni infuses Death Rides a Horse with his signature style, crafting a revenge story that's heavy on suspense and dark atmosphere. This one's all about intensity. Imagine a young man watching his family get unalived and spending his life plotting vengeance. He crosses paths with an older gunslinger, played by Lee Van Cleef, who's got his own reasons for hunting down the same men. And what follows is a tense, gritty partnership built on mutual grudges. The style? Pure spaghetti western gold. Dramatic close-ups, a haunting Morricone score, which was also famously used in Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volume 1, and revenge so thick you can practically taste it. Think of it as the revenge western you didn't know you needed. A dark, shadowy gem hiding in the genre. Perfect. If you're up for something that keeps you guessing, who's using who? (sighs) Campaneros in 1970. Who knew revolution could be this much fun? Sergio Corbucci, the man who gave us Django and the Great Silence, flips the script here with a more comedic anti-establishment tale of unlikely alliances and bumbling bandits. Campanero stars Franco Nero, a.k.a. Django, as a Swedish arms dealer who teams up with a Mexican rebel, 
played by Tomas Milian. To liberate a political prisoner. It's got all the classic spaghetti western grits, but with a good dose of humor and anti-hero antics. Kind of like this channel. This is the western where you'll actually catch yourself laughing between the shootouts. And with Corbucci at the helm, it's a smart, sharp ride through revolution and loyalty. If you're looking for a western that'll give you some laughs with your action, Gambineros is the way to go. These films aren't just lesser known, they're hidden treasures of the spaghetti western genre that push boundaries, whether it's through revolutionary ideas, unique revenge plots, or a little unexpected humor. Perfect for anyone tired of the same old shootouts, these movies bring something new to the table. So saddle up and prepare for a ride and journey off the beaten trail. Spaghetti Westerns were more than just a fresh take on an American genre. They were a cinematic revolution. In the hands of directors like Sergio Leone, Sergio Corbucci, and others, these films pushed the boundaries of storytelling, challenging audiences with their gritty realism, morally ambiguous characters, and innovative visuals. Decades later, the influence of Spaghetti Western still ripples through cinema, shaping genres from action to drama and even science fiction. Filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino, Martin Scorsese, and Robert Rodriguez have all cited Spaghetti Westerns as major influences, barring stylistic elements and paying homage to these films and their work. For instance, Tarantino's Django Unchained draws direct inspiration from Corbucci's Django, while Kill Bill utilizes Leone's dramatic close-ups and tension-building silences, as well as including many Ennio Morricone compositions. By popularizing the anti-hero and exploring the grittier side of the frontier, spaghetti westerns open doors for storytelling that goes beyond good versus evil, paving the way for more morally complex films. They're proof that a film doesn't need a huge budget to be epic. It just needs a bold vision and a willingness to break the rules. Today, these films resonate not only for their timeless stories, but for how they transform cinema itself. The genre also helped shape the anti-hero archetype in modern cinema, influencing storytelling in various genres. The morally ambiguous protagonists of spaghetti westerns paved the way for more complex characters in contemporary films. Traditional westerns, especially in Hollywood, often presented clear-cut heroes and villains. Spaghetti westerns turned that on its head, giving audiences morally ambiguous protagonists who were flawed, gritty, and often as ruthless as the villains they faced. This led to the birth of the archetype, the man with no name, the lone drifter who isn't here to save anyone, but is willing to do what it takes to survive. Characters like Clint Eastwood's in the Dollars trilogy have influenced generations of screenwriters and directors, showing that audiences connect with complex, imperfect protagonists. This anti-hero archetype has even become a cornerstone of modern storytelling, particularly in crime dramas, neo-noirs, and even superhero films, where characters like Batman and Deadpool carry that same gritty, morally ambiguous vibe. The shift paved the way for the anti-heroes we see not just in modern cinema, but television series leads, from Tony Soprano to Walter White, who are compelling precisely because they're complicated. Spaghetti Westerns also popularized a grittier, more realistic approach to the West. They depicted the frontier as harsh, dusty, and unforgiving, rather than the romanticized wilderness seen in earlier Hollywood Westerns. This dirty realism resonates today as audiences gravitate towards films and shows that showcase life's raw, unfiltered side. Series like Westworld and Deadwood incorporate the spaghetti western aesthetic, showing how this down-to-earth style has become central to how we envision the western world. Beyond the individual's journey, spaghetti westerns sometimes tackled issues of social justice, political corruption, and the brutality of frontier life. A Bullet for the General and The Great Silence, for example, are infused with political themes that critique authoritarianism, class struggles, and the abuse of power. These films are reminders that the Western genre can be more than just a tale of lone heroes. They can be powerful commentaries on society, relevant across time and borders. 
And in addition to thematic elements, spaghetti western genre contributed legendary scores, usually used as harbingers of impending doom and showdowns. One composer in particular, who we've mentioned a lot in this video, Ennio Morricone, was a notable contributor. Morricone's iconic scores are inseparable from the genre. His music, filled with haunting vocals, whistling, and unconventional instrumentation, amplified the tension and atmosphere of spaghetti westerns. His work didn't just accompany scenes. It became a storytelling tool, adding emotional weight to those otherwise sparse, dialogue-free moments. Today, his influence can be heard in countless films, from Tarantino's The Hateful Eight to The Mandalorian, where music is used as an essential character rather than just background noise. However, sometimes in spaghetti westerns, there was a sound that was just as powerful as the dramatic scores. As a famous duo once sung, it was the sound of silence. Spaghetti westerns made silence as important as sound. Leone and others used silence to create unbearable tension before explosive action. The long pauses before a gunfight filled only with the sounds of creaking leather and whistling wind gave scenes a tension that dialogue couldn't achieve. This technique has carried over to modern action and thriller films where the absence of sound can speak volumes and create an atmosphere of suspense, pulling audiences in deeper. Audiences that not only existed in theaters, but around the globe. Spaghetti Westerns were Italian in origin, but gained a global following, challenging the idea that Westerns were purely an American genre. By setting classic Western themes in foreign landscapes and adding European sensibility, directors like Leone and Corbucci created a hybrid genre that resonated across cultures. The genre's international impact can be seen in Asian, European, and Latin American cinema. Akira Kurosawa's samurai films inspired spaghetti westerns. These cross-cultural exchanges demonstrate spaghetti westerns' unique ability to adapt and influence, bridging genres and culture to create stories with universal themes. This cross-cultural appeal has helped keep spaghetti westerns relevant worldwide. And it's why these films are still referenced, remade, and celebrated today. Spaghetti westerns didn't just reinvent the western. They changed the way we think about storytelling itself. The spaghetti western is far more than a footnote in film history. It's a master class in style, character, and storytelling that continues to inspire filmmakers and captivate audiences around the world. From redefining the anti-hero to embracing silence as a narrative tool, these films expanded the possibilities of cinema, bringing gritty realism and complexity to the Western genre and beyond. In many ways, they were ahead of their time, exploring themes and techniques that still feel fresh today. For modern audiences, these films are more than just relics. They're master classes in tension, style, and moral complexity. Anyone looking to understand the roots of modern cinema's most compelling characters, tense standoffs, and immersive atmospheres, these spaghetti westerns remain an essential watch, a bold reminder of what cinema can achieve when it dares to go against the grain, making them essential viewing for anyone interested in film history and the evolution of cinematic storytelling. Well, my compañeros, that's just how the tumbleweed rolls. This is my evaluation, but let me know. What do you think? Have you ever heard of spaghetti westerns? Do you recognize any of these scores used in modern cinema? Do you wear a cowboy hat or drag a coffin through the streets of a wild west town in the middle of a day? It's just a regular Tuesday, am I right? <laughs> Let me know in the comments below where you should also subscribe and have a showdown with the like button and make that bell toll like the high noon bell in a dusty city of frontier dread. Say safe out there, my compañeros. It's pretty dangerous. And I'll see you in the next video. Adios, amigos. That was a wild west run of emotions while I was filming. Thank God you didn't see. You'd think I was crazier than I am on screen.